traffic. Anyone living in London or Beijing or Shanghai or New York hates traffic. Not only because it makes it difficult to get from A to B, but also because of the pollution caused by traffic. And pollution caused by traffic is what, ex what economists refer to as an externality or external effect, or sometimes also spillover effect. Why? Because basically all these individual decisions have external effects on third parties that are not really part of the decision-making process of the market, if, if you want. So as an example, I don't actually have a car, but I still have to breathe in the toxic fumes from cars driving through Islington and Camden. So more generally, we think of externalities as any time an individual or firm produces or consumes something um, that affects others, third parties, people, the environment, without this actually affecting the market price, without being priced in. What are examples of externalities? Well, one we just talked about, the individual driver makes a decision to drive from A to B, causing pollutions, pollution that other people have to breathe in, in terms of particulates or in terms of CO2 emissions and sulfur dioxide emissions. This in turn causes childhood asthma and premature death. The World Health Organization thinks that up to 7 million deaths are caused by pollution every year. Um, what are other examples? Other examples of sort of production related uh, externalities are toxic waste pumped into the air or pumped into rivers by private enterprises. Or we can think about consumption externalities like the use of antibiotics. My uncertainty about whether it's a viral or bacterial infection and taking antibiotics just in case of course means that if we all act like that we end up with sort of antibiotic resistance and we have seen similar type problems in when we talked about common pool resources last week what's the biggest externality of all the biggest sort of problem of all climate change we all buy products and engage in behaviors that lead to co2 emissions which are directly causing um, the, the, you know, the global uh, warming that we are experiencing. And we and many others and future generations will bear the cost of this behavior. These are all examples of negative externalities. But there can also be positive externalities. For example, the beekeeper, a very classic example. Uh, the beekeeper is raising his bees uh, to make honey. Mm? But uh, the, of course, the farmers in the nearby, uh, owning the nearby fields and, and, and pastures and, and, and forests benefit from the beekeepers' bees pollinating the flowers. Or a more concrete example, my daughter got a measles vaccination. That's great. So she doesn't get measles. But I am also, of course, helping with what is called herd immunity. And it has gotten a bit of a bad rap lately but of course herd immunity via vaccination is really really helpful it means that even some people who for various reasons maybe can't get a vaccination or forget or whatever are maybe also protected because most kids have a measles vaccination and therefore measles don't spread so much another classic example of a positive externality would be renovating your house in the street that benefits you directly but a nice looking house and many nice looking houses maybe also help sort of raise the value of the neighborhood more generally and therefore the sales price, for example, of your neighbor's houses. And finally, education. A more educated work and workforce and people um, not only have benefits for themselves in the sense that they maybe get better jobs, but also lead to a you know, better society overall. If you want, maybe pause the video for a second, take a piece of paper and think about positive and negative externalities. Can you think of other examples? Okay, moving on. In this week's readings, 
In the excellent Economy, Society and Public Policy textbook, chapter 11, you encountered the problem of pesticide use on the beautiful island of Guadeloupe. So what's the story? Well, the basic idea is that you have banana producers who use pesticides on their plantations in order to grow more bananas, to protect them from, from, uh, from, from pests, from insects. But the problem with pesticide use is that it leaks into the water and it contaminated the local sort of seafood and fish stocks, uh, which negatively impacted the fishermen that relied on these seafood and fish stocks uh, for, their, for their livelihood. And it also has health effects, of course, on the people eating this seafood. So what makes it an external effect on externality? On the right, we see the um, sort of now familiar sort of diagram with the quantity of bananas on the x-axis and the price or costs um, on the y-axis. And what you see is the marginal private cost of the plantation owners. So the more bananas they produce, the more costly it gets on the margin to produce an additional ton of ton of bananas. Mm -hmm. um, and this is basically their cost structure, and this is what they use to find how many bananas they should try to produce on their plantations. So far, so good. This is basically the supply curve of the banana plantation owners or the producers. But what's missing? Well, what's missing is this. There is a marginal external cost. Um, it's the cost imposed on the fishermen by the plantations that use the pe pesticide. So basically for every you know, ton of bananas um, that the plantation produces, so the more intensive the production gets, the more pesticides have to be sprayed. And that, of course, negatively impacts the fishermen. So the more pesticides are being used, the worse for the fishermen, the worse for, 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 the, for the seafood and the, the livelihood of the fishermen. So the true social cost of the banana production using pesticide is not given by the marginal private cost of the plantation owners, but instead is given by the marginal private cost of the plantation owners plus the costs imposed on the fishermen, on the fishermen uh, by, the, by the plantation owners through the use of pesticides. And so this is the classic example of a negative externality. The marginal social cost hmm, is higher than the marginal private cost faced by the decision maker. It's the classic example of a production externality. So we essentially have our supply curves. What about demand? Let's make our life a bit easy. Let's say the world market price of bananas is $400 per, per ton um, and that the small plantations in Guadeloupe don't actually affect the world market price of bananas. This makes it a bit easier to look at the external effects without taking sort of demand effects into account. Now, in the Stiglitz book, for example, or in other treatments, you will see um, a, a something that, that resembles a demand curve, so a marginal social benefit curve, uh, usually. And that's great. Uh, so, for example, if you think about electricity production and you think that um, that sort of higher cost uh, of production also affects the overall market price, which then in turn also affects demand. So people um, saving energy, for example. So that's that's great. So that's something we we can definitely definitely consider. But for a simple example, let's just assume that the price is fixed, uh, which makes the makes the graphs a bit easier. So how many tons of bananas do the Guadeloupe plantation owners produce? Well, like any firm, they set MR equal to MC. So they set the um, uh, marginal private cost equal to the marginal revenue they get for the bananas. In other words, um, point A. So they produce up to the point where the price that they earn for an additional ton of bananas, always $400 in this example, equals their marginal private cost. So where the point is where they can produce another ton of bananas and just about break even with that. So to the left of point A, they still make some money. So they incur costs that are already quite high, but they still still profit. And to the to the to the right of point A, um, it would not be um, profitable to produce uh, produce bananas 
or more bananas for that matter. So given the world market price of bananas, $400, we end up with a production level of 80,000 uh, tons of bananas per year. Great. What's the problem? Well, the problem is that this is not the Pareto efficient outcome. Why? Because the, plant, the fishermen are actually incurring this external cost. So what could we do instead? Think about it this way. At point A, the fishermen are incurring an additional sort of external cost to their livelihood as a group of $270 per ton of banana. So at this point A, the fishermen could get together and say, look, plantation owners, we don't like your pesticide use. We're going to pay you $270 per ton to reduce production of bananas by one ton. And the plantation owners would accept this because at the point A, basically their profit from selling one more ton of bananas is really, really small, right? So their costs are already like, their marginal uh, private cost is already like $399 or something. So they just about make money by selling one additional uh, additional unit. And so if the fishermen instead offered them say $270, they would be happy to reduce production by one ton, one ton of bananas. In fact, anything between, if it's $399, dollars marginal private cost, anything between sort of $1 and $270 would make the banana plantation owners better off. Um, and anything in between would also make the fishermen better off. So we could make everyone better off by reducing the total banana output and having the fishermen pay the uh, plantation owners some money for that. So what about another payment? to reduce the production level by another ton to 79,998 tons of banana per year. Would the banana plantation owners accept this payment? Of course. So the fishermen could pay the banana plantation owners a little more money to make them indifferent between producing another uh, ton of bananas or, um, or not um, out of sort of the gains that they have from the reduced pollution. How far can we push this sort of thought experiment? Well, all the way down to the point where the um, price uh, intersects with the marginal social cost, and that's 38,000 tons of banana. So that would be the level taking into account the true social cost of the banana production process, because it would take into account both the private cost to the banana plantation producers, banana plantation owners, and the cost to the, to the fishermen. And that would be actually the Pareto efficient outcome in this market. I hope everyone followed along with this reasoning. So we can get from the current uh, market price and quantity, huh? 80,000 uh, tons of banana, all the way down to 38,000 tons of bananas by bargaining over the sort of size of the compensation payment the fishermen have to make to the plantation owners. Mm -hmm. um, and then that would work up to the point uh, where the price equals the uh, marginal social cost. So there no more gains can be made. Um, and that's how we know that this is the Pareto efficient outcome. So nobody would be able to make to be made better off without making someone worse off. But that's not point A, it's the point where the price uh, equals the marginal social cost um, for the bananas. So the negative external effect here has led to the overproduction uh, of bananas and the overuse of pesticides. Um, and we're not currently at this Pareto efficient uh, uh, level that we want to be at. Um, but we are at this point A instead, and that's what we, of course, know as a market failure. So we have identified the problem. We have our diagnosis. Um, but so how do we get to the to the Pareto efficient level, to the optimal level of output? Uh, how do we fix the market failure due to externalities? As always, we have to think about solutions. So. The solutions we will encounter in the next videos 
entail both private and public solutions. When we talk about private solutions, you will learn about internalizing the externality and Coasian bargaining or the Coas theorem. Um, but we will also speak about the problems associated with, uh, with these ideas. Um, for example, thinking about the so-called holdout problem, which those of you who watch Better Call Saul are familiar with from season five. We will then, in a second video, look at public solutions. Public solutions um, entail things like direct regulation of, of uh, emissions um, or carbon taxes, like in the, um, in the um, uh, recommended reading on the introduction of carbon tax in Sweden. Um, and we will encounter what sometimes is called quantity-based regulation or uh, marketable permits or cap and trade type systems such as the European emissions trading system. Um, and we will conclude with a specific case study on the use of coal to create electricity in the UK.